Um, good afternoon everybody and uh, so we're looking at this subject of what the Bible says about prayer and I suppose the important thing is what does the Bible say about prayer that affects us today that we should um, take into our lives and adopt for ourselves well the answer to that uh, second part of it is quite easy the Bible tells us the Bible tells us there um, Philippians 4 verse 6 be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 to 18 rejoice evermore pray without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you so these were words written by Paul the Apostle to um, the early followers of Jesus in the towns of Philippi and Thessalonica and he was telling them that they must pray that prayer is a very important part of uh, life following God and following Jesus in everything by prayer and supplication uh, in Philippians and uh, pray without ceasing in Thessalonians and if that was what the followers of Jesus had to do then uh, then it follows by extension that those who want to follow Jesus and those who want to do God's will today uh, should also be praying and uh, before we leave those it's worth noting as well that that on both occasions thanksgiving is mentioned there as well isn't it in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving uh, pray without ceasing in everything give thanks so an important part of prayer is thanksgiving giving thanks to God for the things that he does for us and in this, in uh, Paul telling the followers of Jesus that they had to pray, he was uh, only following on from what Jesus himself had said. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, uh, Jesus spake a parable unto them, and it's to his disciples mainly that he seems to be saying this. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And that word to faint means to turn out badly so by extension if you don't want to turn out badly then you should pray and pray for strength from God and he then tells this parable the parable of the unjust judge so he says there was in a city a judge which feared not God nor regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though I fear not God nor regard man Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So those are the words of Jesus then, telling his followers, and again by extension those who would follow him today, that they should pray, they should always pray, they should regularly pray. And he gives the example of this uh, unsuitable judge. He's unsuitable to be a judge really, isn't he? He's not motivated by... Uh, by what is right that word avenge when the widow says avenge me of mine adversary the word means to give full justice so she's not just looking for revenge she's actually looking for justice which is what a judge should be interested in isn't it but he's not interested in that is he he's he's motivated not by what is right what is just by by what makes his own life easier by his own comfort or in this occasion uh, discomfort he says there he has no respect for God or for man and so Jesus says if that's the example of the unjust judge he says he says how much more will God uh, give justice to those who follow him if that's what an unjust judge can do then God will do so much more and later on in the same chapter Luke chapter 18 he he tells another parable Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. It's a parable about two men. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So was that a good prayer? Well, there's a clue right at the beginning, isn't there? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. 
it it was addressed to God the prayer was addressed to God wasn't it but but it wasn't really for God's benefit it was the benefit for the benefit of the Pharisee it was more a, an exercise in self-congratulation he says uh, well he, he says to God although it wasn't really addressed to God but he's he's saying I'm not like uh, I'm not like other people I do this I do that you're lucky to have me and I'm, I'm definitely not like this miserable excuse for a man uh, here next to me and what about that man that publican what about his prayer then the second man and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven but smote upon his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner so what do we see from him then well we saw the pride from the Pharisee didn't we we saw the pompousness and here we see humility here we see a man who knows his face uh, his place in front of God and he keeps it between him and God doesn't he? he he could have said well I'm glad I'm not like this Pharisee alongside me that that just tells you how wonderful he is all the time but it's nothing to do with him is it it's between God and the man and so he keeps his word simple and to the point God be merciful to me a sinner and so we're being told about prayer here aren't we we're told that we should always pray men ought always to pray or we should pray without ceasing both Paul and Jesus have, have told us that in the verses we've looked at we saw from the words of Paul that we should give thanks in our prayers we also saw that we should keep on praying keep on asking for things that's the example from the widow isn't it she she kept on asking for the justice that she deserved and and eventually the unjust judge gave in and gave her that justice and we'll see other examples of that later on as well and so Jesus says well well how much more will God respond if you keep on asking him for uh, the things that you need so that also tells us that God does respond to prayer doesn't it God God does hear uh, faithful prayer that's expressed in the right way we have to remember that we are praying to God that's what the Pharisee teaches us isn't it the example of the Pharisee he prayed with himself we must make sure that our prayers are directed to God and if we do that then we will also pray with humility as the um, as the publican did <laughs> And going back to Paul again in the words of Paul he tells us also a little bit about how we should pray because he tells us in 1st of Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus and just a few verses later at verse 8 he says I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting so contained in there is a very important piece of information for us about prayer because we've been told to pray haven't we Paul has, has told the followers then and, and Jesus told his disciples that they had to pray and, and surely that comes to us today comes through to us today so how do we pray then how does, do our prayers come to God and that's telling us isn't it our means of access to God is through Jesus Christ through our prayers we do in effect speak to God through Jesus Christ because he takes our prayers and brings them to God he plays that vital role for us the mediator between us and God and so for Christ to be our mediator that must mean that our prayers are heard then God must hear our prayers and be able to respond to them we spoke just a moment or two ago about humility didn't we the need for humility in prayer and we see that if we look at the first use of the word prayer in the Bible uh, surprisingly it's not until 2nd of Samuel chapter 7 in fact so surprisingly that uh, I was quickly trying to check this out uh, before uh, just a few minutes ago before this just to double check that I was right in this um, the word pray occurs many times before this uh, it's a slightly different word um, some of those times it simply means a request I pray you to do this uh, but this is the first time that the word prayer actually occurs in the Bible and it's a time when King David is wanting to build a house for God 
so the king says to God's prophet, uh, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan tells him to go ahead and, and build God a house as he, as he wants. But actually this isn't what God wants David to do. And he says in verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, he's speaking to his prophet, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? And God, through Nathan the prophet, goes on to tell David that in fact, he, God, is going to build David a house. Not just a house as in a, a, a place with bricks and mortar or however the house is built, but a house as in a, a, a genealogy behind him, a um, descendants from him, uh, centred around a particular de descendant who will reign forever. Uh, speaking of Jesus in the future kingdom uh, verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7 thine house and thy kingdom shall be established before thee forever and thy throne shall be established forever so God is telling Jesus um, God is telling David not only about Solomon his son who will sit on his throne but about David King David's greater son about Jesus sorry King David's greater son who is the one who will sit on the throne forever when the kingdom is established forever and in particular it's the response of David to this that we see where we see this humility and so uh, verse 27 David in his response to God says for thou O Lord of hosts God of Israel hast revealed to thy servant saying I will build thee an house therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee and that's our first occurrence as I say of the word prayer so just going back a step to verse 18, David's words there. He starts off his prayer by saying, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord. But thou hast spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And so he's responding with humility there, isn't he? And he, he goes on to speak of God's greatness, as contrasted with uh, man's humility and man's lowliness uh, wherefore thou art great O Lord God for there is none like thee neither is there any God beside thee according to all that we have heard with our ears and then at verse 25 he says and now O Lord God the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servants and concerning this ha concerning his house establish it for ever and do as thou hast said and in effect that's David saying Amen isn't it the word Amen means uh, let it be so so be it and that's what he's saying here isn't it do as thou hast said and it's there also in verse 29 therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant that it may continue forever before thee for thou O Lord God hast spoken it and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever so again David is saying let it be as you have said he says Amen at the end of his prayer a, a prayer that contains humility as well as acknowledging God's greatness and those are important things that we need to remember in our prayers that that we need to be humble and we need to um, acknowledge how great God is uh, so David had wanted to build God a house and was prevented from doing so but God had said that that his son Solomon would build him that house that David was speaking of the temple for the worship of God um, and when De Solomon had finished building the temple uh, there was a dedication service and Solomon gave a prayer at that and it was quite a long prayer and uh, uh, there is a little aspect of it that's quite interesting to look at in the general subject of prayer uh, so it's first of Kings chapter 8 and verse 28 onwards so Solomon says yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication O Lord my God to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today. I'm going to verse 30. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. And when thou hearest, forgive. So uh, there Solomon is saying to God, is asking God to hear his prayer and to hear the prayer of, of his people also, the people of Israel, whenever they prayed uh, toward him. Uh, and a few verses further on as well Solomon says when heaven is shut up and there is no rain verse 35 because they have sinned against thee 
If they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants, and of thy people Israel. And one of the most interesting things in this, that um, we might not have noticed, is that if we go to the parallel record in First of Chronicles, and at chapter 7, we find that God actually comes back to Solomon on this and says, I, I will hear your prayer, I have heard your prayer, and I will hear your prayer. Uh, verse 12, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Isn't that wonderful that Solomon got such an immediate response to his prayer? It's exactly what he had prayed for and God comes back to him and says, I will do those things. I will hear your prayer. I will hear the people's prayer. So God does hear prayer and God does respond to prayer. Uh, we'll just um, notice that. Um, did you notice there this... Um, where it says about uh, there being no rain, uh, God withholding the rain if the people do not, uh, if the people forsake Him. Uh, well, we'll um, we'll see that again in a moment. If we go to James chapter five, uh, so back into the New Testament, uh, verse fifteen, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then James gives an example. So he says, uh, if a prayer is, is right, if a prayer is, is proper, then it can achieve a great deal. An example he gives is the example of Elijah. Uh, Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And that's exactly what Solomon's been speaking about, isn't it, at the dedication of the temple. So why is it that Solomon mentions it there, and, and now James mentions it here as Elijah, having, uh, having asked God to do this thing? And, and again, we see that God hears Elijah's prayer and, and responds to it, don't we? So another little lesson there of God hearing prayer and responding. But it all goes back to the law of Moses and Deuteronomy chapter 11 and a warning from God to the people. Deuteronomy 11 verse 16 Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit. So that's what Elijah was referring to. God had said that if you, uh, if you forsake me, then one of the things I can do is withhold the rain and, and cause famine and other things to come upon your land. And at the time of Elijah, when Elijah asked God to do this, that's exactly what the people were doing. They had forsaken God. They were worshipping false gods and idols. And so Elijah asks God to, to do what he had said he would do to see if that would make the people turn back to him. And whilst it made some turn back to him, the the result was not perhaps as great as Elijah would have wanted or as God would have wanted uh, some more examples of God hearing people's prayers and responding to them uh, back into the New Testament and again the words of Paul once more 2nd of Corinthians chapter 12 uh, verse 7 we start at Paul says there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure there are different ideas about what that thorn in the flesh was we're not told clearly in the scriptures there are little hints it it could be a problem with his eyesight it could be um, an illness a fever that he had that he never fully recovered from um, it could be the Jews that were uh, at one stage were following him around and trying to disrupt uh, his preaching whatever it is Paul asked for it to be removed and it says there for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me and God said unto me 
my grace is sufficient for thee my strength is made perfect in weakness and it's an important verse that because it shows that God does respond but he's responded differently here hasn't he so God has heard the prayer of Paul and he's responding, responded to it by saying no I, I'm not going to do what you've asked for uh, Paul could have thought well well, if this whatever it is is removed I'll be able to preach more effectively I'll be able to bring more people to God but God says it's not going to be my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness and, and perhaps it was that Paul had to had to learn something that this problem taught Paul something so God does answer but the answer on this occasion was no and we need to remember that that if God doesn't seem to answer things the way we would like him to it may be that he has answered uh, but it's not been fulfilled in the way we want that God has said no and the other thing to note from there as well before we move on is uh, that Paul asked three times for this to depart from him and remember we were saying about the parable of the unjust judge that um, the, the, the woman comes to him several times and asks and, and that is why the unjust judge responds and again here it's there isn't it uh, that Paul asks that time and time again and, until he actually gets his answer and we'll still see it uh, again it was actually there in our introductory reading which we'll be coming, with shor coming to shortly uh, another prayer recorded for us a prayer of Jesus in Luke chapter 22 and it's at a particularly difficult time for Jesus he's in the garden of Gethsemane he's, uh, he's about to be betrayed and taken and crucified on the cross and he takes Peter, James and John and it says in verse 40 when he was at the place he said unto them pray that ye enter not into temptation and that I think is remarkable in itself isn't it uh, Jesus is there facing perhaps the most difficult time of his life and he doesn't say pray for me we would have excused him for doing that wouldn't he so pray for me because I need all the strength I can get to to face what lies ahead of of me but he also knows what lies ahead of his disciples and so he tells them to pray for themselves pray that ye enter not into temptation and it would help if I uh, yes this is up on the board um, verse 41 he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him and that's his answer that's how God responds here God answers Jesus and he answers him by sending an angel to him to strengthen him to encourage him the answer was no uh, it could not be removed it's worth noting as well that that Jesus always accepted God's will he wasn't asking for God to completely not do what what he had to do he was asking is there any way I can it can be done he accepts that God's will over overrides his own he says I will do your will I am going to do your will but but is there another way it can be achieved and the answer is no there isn't and, and God sent, gives that answer as I say by sending the angel and it's also worth noting as well verse 44 being in an agony Jesus prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground and that's a prayer that Jesus gives knowing that he has to go ahead with it knowing that there is no other way and that's the prayer that is more earnest and that causes great sweat like great drops of blood to fall from him so in other words his his prayer accepting what he has to do and asking for strength to it is more intense than his first prayer asking for it to be taken away and this is borne out in the other gospels as well uh, with their records of the prayers and so we'll we'll go to that uh, introductory reading we had and the lord's prayer as it is commonly known as and the disciples come up to Jesus don't they and they say Lord teach us to pray as Jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples came up to him and said Lord teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples and so Jesus is going to tell them how to pray he's going to give them a pattern of prayer 
and tell them about the things that they should pray for and again by extension if we want to be his followers the things that we should pray for also and the first thing he tells them is that they must give glory to God he said unto them when ye pray say our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name and we alluded to this earlier didn't we when we said that um, uh, that we should mention the, how great God is the glory of God uh, that was mentioned in earlier prayers that we looked at uh, thy kingdom come thy will be done as in heaven so in earth so we should pray for the kingdom the Bible tells us that, that Jesus is going to return to this earth to set up God's kingdom and we're told here that we should pray for it a time when God's will will be done on this earth as it is now done in heaven give us day by day our daily bread so we should pray for those temporal things that God gives us and, and we should thank him for those shouldn't we that's an aspect of the thanksgiving that we mentioned that should be in our prayers we thank him for those things he gives us um, and pray for them to continue and we should pray for forgiveness of our sins forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us and there's a little challenge there isn't there as well not only do we ask for our sins to be forgiven but we say that likewise we will forgive those who sin against us so so it behoves us to do that doesn't it we have to uh, forgive those who sin against us as we hope to be forgiven our sins by God and we pray for avoidance of temptation and deliverance from evil and so that's a, a, a sample prayer that we've been given by Jesus and, and it contains pretty much everything we need to have in our prayers in fact there's only one thing it doesn't contain that we're told uh, we need to do and that is that our prayer should be through Jesus and perhaps as it's Jesus himself that was saying it uh, he was too humble to actually say that in this prayer but elsewhere it is apparent that, that we give our prayers through Jesus and he takes them to God so our prayers are offered through the name of Jesus and this aspect of Jesus um, of the prayer sorry Jesus telling us that we pray to our Father um, also helps us to understand about prayer as well and how we go to God in prayer and our relationship with God in prayer because it teaches us that that we are God's children he is our father and we are God's children that is a great privilege that that he has given to us that we can call him our father now a parent knows what their children need doesn't they don't they um, the Bible tells us that God knows everything that we need God knows our thoughts before they're our own even and we might say well well what can we possibly pray to God for that he doesn't know already well by and large we know what our children need don't we and, and we could just do everything they need to do for them without them having to ask for anything couldn't we and yet we teach our child to ask for things and we'll have the thing there that the child needs and we'll say but you need to ask properly before we can give it to you and that's an important lesson that, that the child has to learn isn't it the child learns by asking for those things and when the child asks for the things correctly the things it needs and asks in the correct manner and says, says please and thank you then we're pleased by that uh, we are pleased by our children asking for things correctly and in all these things it's exactly the same with God and us a mutually beneficial relationship is built up between between us and our children by them learning how to ask for things learning what to ask for and and come in and asking us for them and we respond to that and it's the same in our relationship with God we are his children and he is our father and, and he knows what we need and so yes we we don't need to ask him for anything in effect because he knows it but but we're told that we must ask we learn by asking for these things just as the, the child learns by asking for things and when we ask for things and we ask for them aright we ask for them correctly then God is pleased by what we have done and by doing that a mutually beneficial relationship is built up between us and God through the Lord Jesus Christ the, Jesus then follows this on with um, another parable doesn't he a very similar parable actually to the 
uh, parable of the unjust judge um, they they seem to me to be quite linked because they both only occur in Luke's gospel and they both seem to be given as the same message uh, we won't go through that parable again but of course it was the the friend at midnight who who wanted some bread to feed somebody else with who just arrived he said he wasn't going to respond but but because of his importunity he does he gets up and he he, he does what his friend had asked him to do and that word importunity means shamelessness so in other words the the man who was knocking at the door was not ashamed and and he just carried on knocking he wasn't self-conscious he wasn't ashamed to do so he carried on knocking until actually the the man inside the house was the one who became ashamed and and went and and gave him the bread that he needed and so again it's we're being told the same thing that we were from uh, the parable of the un unjust judge and others that we must keep on asking we mustn't be ashamed to keep on asking for the things that we need there is then the bit about um, ask and ye shall receive seek and and knock and keep on knocking and and those words although it doesn't come across in our English language the word ask and the word seek and the word knock the original word suggests that not just ask but ask and keep on asking knock and keep on knocking and we saw early didn't we that that we saw from the words of Paul pray without ceasing Jesus said men ought always to pray the parable of the unjust judge uh, showed us that we must keep asking for those things that we need and Paul when he besought the Lord that he should remove the thorn in the flesh from him he besought the Lord thrice and so so the message there is that that we must keep on praying we don't just pray once and then think well we've covered everything and just don't bother again we keep praying for the things that we need and in doing so we are regularly speaking to God through Jesus there's a verse in uh, Isaiah that speaks of keeping on asking for things Isaiah 62 verse 6 and 7 uh, God says through the prophet Isaiah I have set watchmen upon my walls O Jerusalem which shall never hold their peace day nor night ye that make mention of the Lord keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise on the earth so we're being told to pester God keep on asking don't keep quiet don't hold your peace give him no rest uh, keep asking God to establish Jerusalem as a peace in the earth uh, as a praise in the earth and we're told to keep on asking and so what it's telling us there to do is is to keep praying for God's kingdom to come that's the reason why I've left the heading up thy kingdom come and if we look elsewhere in the Old Testament uh, to Psalm 122 there we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem for they shall prosper that love thee and it's the same thing that we're being told to pray for God's kingdom to come I didn't used to understand that verse properly I used to think well well why do we pray for Jerusalem when in fact many of the Jews don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah but it was uh, a speaker that said many years ago uh, in a talk that what we're actually doing when we pray for the priests of Jerusalem is we are praying for the time when Jerusalem will be at peace and it it fits in with the previous one doesn't it give God no rest till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth so Jerusalem will not be at peace until God sends Jesus back to this earth to set up his kingdom with Jerusalem at the center of it and then Jerusalem will finally be at peace and so when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem we are saying pretty much the same as Jesus had said that we must ask in that prayer our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done as in heaven so in earth and so we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem we should pray for God's kingdom to come when Jesus will rule this world in righteousness and so to these things we say Amen. Let it be so.